So I, who's uh, met me before? All right, there's a few people. So if you're used to like cheery stuff and like fun, goofy jokes and stuff, as you can see from the title, it's possible that it's gonna be a little less cheery than usual, uh, which is why I'm dressed like this, uh, which I would never impose on you ever again. Um, so it's, it's kind of a serious topic, um, and it's the first time that I talk about something like this at a, at a conference this big, in a room this wide, which is gonna be interesting. It's also the first time I tell this story, so, well, really this story in this way, so if it's messy, it's normal, life is messy, death is also messy, so just like roll with it if you can, and you can laugh at me if you want, you can cry with me if you want, it doesn't really matter. Um, if you, um, I really recommend, since I probably forget, I will forget to say this after, uh, I really recommend you going to see Ernie Miller's talk after this, it's a perfect sequel, it's gonna get a real, 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 we, way more than my talk is gonna be. So let's get started. Since I said that it would be a lighthearted talk, um, I'm gonna start with something very, you know, set the mood a little bit. Uh, we are all going to die, without exception. There you go. Yeah! Uh, our websites are gonna 404. We're probably gonna tell our friends or we are going to try to see if our websites, our old websites are still alive somewhere in the Wayback Machine, but probably a lot of the links are gonna be dead. So it's gonna be sad. This is what we do, we make things that disappear really quickly, and we also disappear really quickly. Nice. So this is me, usually I'm more cheery and uh, I talk about things that are a little bit more fun. I work for a company called Code School and I've been doing that for like the last six, six years now. And this company was acquired by Pluralsight in 2015 and we do a lot of the same things and we're basically trying to infuse Pluralsight with some of the things that made Code School special for, for so many years. So I'm gonna tell you the story of Code School or any app or any website or any startup or any company that you've been a part of. It's not really that special. It's just one of many stories and I'm gonna try to see if we can glean some useful knowledge and wisdom from the way that our little story happened. So back in late 2010 in Orlando, Florida, a, uh, someone did this, which millions of people have done. Actually, to be realistic, it's probably more like this. Uh, <laughs> the bottom part is just with wishful thinking, but um, yeah, it's probably more like this. So it was, uh, it was my friend actually, Andrew Smith, who I went to school with, who at the time worked for Envy Labs in Florida, and. Uh, they had been working on this idea because they went to conferences and workshops and they had to organize a lot of Rails workshops and they had to do a lot of setup and it would be confusing and messy and people wouldn't be in sync and they wouldn't have the right dependencies installed and stuff was hard so they decided, okay, let's do a thing called Rails for Zombies that'll make that easier where you don't have to do the setup. Uh, this was the first commit to turning Rails for Zombies into its own product, something that other things can be taught on other things than Rails itself. So as usual, when you create a Rails app, you spend you know, a few days changing the defaults, you spend a few days installing the little things that you like, like RSpec or Factory Girl or Factory Bot and Capybara and all these things, nothing special here. Uh, you do see some, some people kind of joining in the fun and starting to, uh, to join the party and then, you know, it's just a few days in December, I think they even worked around the Christmas break because they were probably too excited to, to not do it. Um, and this was the f actual first commit on December 23rd, 22nd, 2010. And the way I joined this story was a full year later in January 2012, after trying everything I could to, to, to get into this adventure because I could see there was something special about it. And I was in school at the time it started, so I, I tried everything I, I could to join this adventure. And at the time it looked like this. So if you've been to good school, if you know good school, it was very textury. There's lots of uh, cool uh, royalty-free art that looks really fancy. And there was also a lot of little buttons and calls to action and share buttons and everything. And at the time, we only taught a few things. I think jQuery Air, Rails for Zombies 2. There's maybe four or five courses. So it was a, a tough sell to sell a subscription to that. And the first thing that I did was nitpicking. Uh, there was a button that wasn't clear enough for uh, team subscriptions, that, that's the first thing I actually touched in that code base. That's all the way out, I think three days after I started working there. Uh, and I think I even put screenshots because I was trying to impress everyone in the commit message. 
Um, and they cut to two years later, a little bit more comfortable and also clearly less worried about impressing people. This was not just self-deprecating, it actually did something really stupid, so um, this is kind of like the range. So earlier, I think DHH talked about uh, barriers to entry in the community, in the programming world. One of the things we were really concerned about to, was to bring people in the Rails community because it just makes it more, you know, there's so many advantages, so many good things that come from that, and that's what we were trying to fight, or trying to circumvent at least. So if you remember from that time, Rails for Zombies was this thing that you just jumped on on a website, you didn't have to install Ruby or have to do any kind of dependency installation and you could just start testing, playing with Ruby, playing with Rails, seeing how the interface worked, how the APIs function and how things in Rails worked in general. That didn't teach you everything but it just got you started really quickly. And we also worked on revamping the Try Ruby website at the time, which was semi-abandoned and made it a little bit more compelling and added a few things to, to make it more you know, responsive and also more secure. And that's basically the formula at the time was it was the right time, browsers could do the things that we're doing and a lot of other companies kind of join in the fun and, and try to teach people that way. The content, which we spent inordinate amount of time building kind of like magicians, like you see them do this really easy trick and you think like, wow, I, how do you possibly do this? It's just way too much time, way too much time and money spent in doing that. And the audience, people like you, which is exactly why I think the success happened and the growth happened the way that it happened was because the people in the community were invested in our success and invested in learning from us with us and that's how it worked. So it, it grew in a few months, faster than I think some people anticipated, slower than others anticipated, and within a few months of me joining, we had revamped the website, we had you know, added a ton of courses for JavaScript, for Node.js, for iOS, for so many other things like Git, and the development experience on the, on the development side, so as, a, as the, the person who worked on the website codeschool.com was something that a lot of people are familiar with when they start out or when they do a pet project, they just, worked on Heroku and pushed things and it was easy, it was fun. And I remember at the time how lovely everything was, like it felt like you were going to a little Japanese garden selecting little things and not really noticing that you were like tallying up six, $700 worth of monthly cost. It was actually fun to crank things up and, and you only noticed at the end of the month, oh wow, we probably don't need to have that many dinos uh, for our courses when no one's watching. But sometimes we'd have spurts of activity when whenever we released a course, it was like this big exciting moment of like, ooh, people are excited, let's crank up the dinos, crank it to 11. And we started getting excited about building this thing because obviously we could see that people got excited. So we started adding gems here and there. People joined the team and they wanted to add a feature here, a feature there, and just thing, things started to just bloat a little bit. And aside from software dependencies, we started having human dependencies because the team grew, the people who depended on us teaching in their companies, the people who in schools were using our software and our courses to teach themselves started expanding. And it wasn't just this little thing that we did ourselves. It was a time where we weren't quite responsible enough to have that on our shoulders and it took a little bit of time to get used to it we started saying things like this, which happens in every slightly successful startup. Why do, why pay Heroku for that much money? We could use that money and do it ourselves, it'd be fine, what, what could go wrong <laughs> when you have 10 people on the team and no ops person full time? Uh, so that usually turned into this, and it took us years, and this is something that I, I hope resonates with other people, it took us years to get back to, maybe I'm exaggerating, the kind of developer experience that we had come to get accustomed to on Heroku because we obviously did not make the calculation uh, correctly. So there, in economics, there's this term opportunity cost, which is a vague definition, I don't really like it. It's the loss of potential gain from other alternatives when one alternative is chosen. So you have a bunch of paths and you pick one and what you lose are the others. This is the way that I think about it in my head. Maybe, this is a random number, $5,000 a month you spend on Heroku, instead you're gonna think, well, we're gonna save some, but then you forget to add payroll, and vacation, and security upgrades, and framework upgrades, and people quitting when they are the only ones who know how to do ops stuff on your team. So it, it amounts to a lot of stuff. So there's another thing that starts happening. 
uh, when you see peers in the community or just successful companies around you, you start thinking, well, hmm, GitHub as their own support app, it's really cute and it's really custom and it's perfectly tailored to their needs and they've shown me a few screenshots and I want one and they won't just share it. So why wouldn't we make one? You know, it's not like we have customers or billing cycles and features and courses and all of these things to, care, to, to take care of anyway. So you start thinking, okay, we're special. So obviously the things that are made for you know, general purpose, they're not quite special enough for us. We're a weird bunch of people and we need a weird bunch of software to cater to our needs and our customers. Uh, but it's not true. You're not that special. That doesn't mean you're not special, you're just not that special. You have to deal with the same things everybody has to deal with. Users, authorizations, databases, emails, billing, servers, browser security, all of these things that we all have in common. All of these things that we build little tools to fix. All of these things we experiment with little Phoenix apps because we want to be on the bleeding edge or even Node because we're insane. And we end up with some, something like this, 103 Ruby repositories for a team that's never been bigger than 50 people, ever. So that's more repositories than we've ever had people. And that's multiplied by all the things we have to do for all of these little tools that we built because we wanted to be special. Um, of course, we were very tempted by this thing that David talked about this morning, which was like, well, active records are not special enough for us. We have needs that are complicated. We have reporting needs or whatever. We have SQL data reports that we need to do, and you know, we are fighting this thing, but it's not worth it. We were trying to justify our difference by picking things that made us slightly different than the common case, instead of just using what was built and just adapting it as much as we could without going oh, aside from it on the side. So that's the same thing for these uh, smaller frameworks that compete with Rails or at least try to provide an alternative with Rails. They're extremely good ground for experimentation for, for us and for many in the community and for many people creating new companies from scratch, they're great alternatives or even when they're building new segments or new products within their companies. The problem is that we start doing this thing where we put Rails on one side and freedom on the other. We put easy on one side, Rails, and simple on the other. Or big and small, or yes and maybe. And maybe because maybe it'll work, but we don't know. And we have the certainty of Rails to back us up. And that's probably what we should stick with, especially when we're a small company with no investors trying to make something sustainable. What's nice about this opposition, however, is that you have a bunch of really interesting good ideas in the community just existing everywhere, and then once in a while, not as often as everybody would like, the ideas percolate into Rails. So just like it's called Ruby on Rails, you can picture it like this. Ruby is this broad, wide, wild west, and some of the ideas sometimes, when you zoom in, there's this little cross-pollination point between the two edges of the community where that starts making sense when where you're using these tools and you find them so productive, so good, so powerful or performant, and you adapt them slowly but surely into things that merge into Rails and become parts of these frameworks that we know, like Active Record, for instance, that, that's taken inspiration from other community tools that are just maybe more apt, maybe more precise tools, but not quite as general purpose. The thing that I remember specifically, I think it was around 2013, was conversations about architecture because you grow so fast when you have a little bit of success like this that you stop thinking, you, you don't have time to think about architecture until you realize, oh crap, we're in a corner, we have to think about it. So I think in 2010, the, the big conversations were, where does my business logic go? Does it go in lib because that's where Ruby puts business logic or logic? Or does it go in app because that's where Rails puts it? So am I mixing Rails logic with my logic? Is, is Rails my application domain or is it not? But at the time we had this problem, services was the thing. People were going crazy over um, SOA and there were articles every week about should I do this? There was a little bit of, you know, you should convert, you should try this because it'll be more sustainable for you. And obviously as a company who is growing more mature, we wanted to be more responsible and sustainable. So at the time, SOA to me was that. 
I didn't really know what it was. Uh, so I looked into it, and at the time, people who joined the team, more senior people than me who joined the team, decided, okay, we're gonna try this. We're gonna try this because it allows us to kind of like have the business activity wrapped into this service, self-contained service that is a black box, that is easier to test, that allows us to have underlying services nested inside of it if necessary, and it's a little bit more clean and well-defined than at the time our Rails models were. The problem was that if we went full on with the service arch architecture, at least distributed service architecture with microservices and all that stuff, we were trading local complexity, which we knew, with perpetual inconsistency. So n lots of work for a team that is not quite big enough to deal with all the network networking problems. So what we did was really simple. We didn't distribute it, we just kept it local. We just kept it all in one app, one big monolith. And it was service-oriented-ish, uh, but we had models and we had services, which was kind of weird, especially when you joined the team. And we had a user create and a create user service, basically, which was also weird. But it made sense, because you could create a user and subscribe the user and then charge that user's subscription for money, and we made money and it was great, and we were refactoring, making a billing system integration at the time, so everything was great until that happened. Someone needed to charge a subscription without having to do the other things, and things started to break because there were entry points that we hadn't anticipated, of course. Uh, and really what, what happens is this tension between these services are basically proxies to these models. As long as you're using Rails, you'll have these models, unless you turn off these methods, which you know, some people do. Um, so you end up with just a, a Rails with a mustache on top, a service mustache. And you make those choices, and eventually after you make those choices, as we did, go full in services, you start thinking, what if we just had you know, embraced the callbacks and the concerns and not have too many concerns about them? What if? The problem is we never had time to actually go back and say, let's change everything. Uh, and that's when I think, that's when, when the company and the team and, the, and the, the, the environment or the group of people that you work with starts to consider that the way we chose is not necessarily the, the absolute best way that we could have chosen. There are some caveats, we have to live with them. I think that's when we reached a modicum of adulthood. The experiment, this little fun little side project that we did at conferences became a product that people depended on. So we had to take it seriously, we had to take performance seriously, we had to take reliability seriously. And the we're not doctors excuse that a lot of startups use stopped being the thing that we could go to to justify doing things kind of haphazardly. The other thing that happened around that time is that because we felt more responsible of our customers, or responsible for, we noticed that, at least on, on the team that took care of CodeSchool.com, there was a lot of instability. There was a lot of people from the consultancy that were helping in, people coming in from another team joining in and leaving because they were working on a course or something like that. There's a lot of instability. And also there was a lack of ownership because of that churn, not necessarily because people left the company, but because people moved around to be flexible in, inside the company. We didn't have enough ownership of the thing that we were building, working on. So not enough people knew the precise deep integrations or uh, the APIs and how they were designed and the services. And that's around the time where these two people came in. On the, I gotta turn around to see it. On the left is Katie, on the right is Joel. And this is when we decided to responsibly and purposefully build our team with people that we nurtured and took care of and grew with the team. Katie uh, has a computer science background and Joel is more like me, he's a literary uh, liberal arts major. Someone that, you know, that I didn't think I would ever meet in a team like that. Um, and that collaboration of the computer science aspect and the liberal arts, just thinking and naming especially, the ability to name things properly was very useful. So we had the, the computer person and the book person, which is a simplicity, a, sim a simple example, and in, in in, a, in many ways, not just through education, but through background, it started bringing a little bit of diversity, which people have many definitions for, many bullshit definitions, many geographical or ethnic or gender-based definitions, 
or simply just perspective, which is kind of like the corporate you know, excuse for diversity. Um, what we had to do when the, the team started becoming more diverse, more interesting, more um, challenging to the way we had done things before was to, to define this kind of framework that when you join the team, you have immunity, at least for six months. Anything you say, we won't do, we won't attack you for it. You can criticize our ways because obviously they're set in this little pool of people that we knew and that we grew with and so you should be feel free to say things like, why are you doing it this way? This seems strange to me. You don't have to be aggressive about it, of course, but you can tell us to our faces and we will show you by being vulnerable when we screw up, which happens all the time, especially in a small company, that we will take your feedback and we will receive it and we won't punish you for it. And when the company becomes more mature, there was this thing that I remember clearly is people started to say things like, well, we have a process. Like, oh, well, we have to attend this meeting because this is part of the process. And people started justifying things that weren't pleasant, productive, that didn't make sense because it was the process. Because they had been so loosey-goosey, they wanted some structure to feel like, you know, we were a serious company. We did, you know, we weren't messing around. Uh, and things like Bibles, basically edicts that just said, this is the way we do things, this is the way we operate, this is the, pro the little steps we have to go through to deploy our software or make our things. And that started kind of like adding rigidity to this process and people started to not enjoy doing the thing that they were enjoying a few months prior as much. Uh, there's this, uh, this quote that's attributed to Mark Twain, but I don't think it's at, at all from Mark Twain, which which is during the gold rush, it's a good time to be in the pick and shovel business. And around that time, I started noticing that we had a lot of shovels in the closet. And everybody does too, because obviously since the startup boom started happening, a lot of companies are, are filling in the cracks and things that we have to do, or that we could do better, or they specialize in. So they, there's this big, big industry of shovel as a service companies that offer you to use something instead of having to make it. And it's a really hard conundrum for people who build software because obviously we could do it. We, we could spend three months making MailChimp, but it would suck and nobody would use it and nobody would maintain it. And this is exactly what happens with not invented here and other problems like this is that we probably should use rather than make, but we're makers. So we have a bias towards making. It's also a, a time around which we, we start worrying a lot more about scalability because of course more people are using us in different countries at different times. We're sleeping sometimes, often, and they're not sleeping, and the website's you know, doing this, and there's big spikes, and we're not responding fast enough because we never considered that we had customers in this other side of the world that doesn't load videos as fast because we don't have CDNs, and we have things like this, and we feel shame. <laughs> And we start to look to the community for, for help, for people like Nate Prokopic, who's like teaching us ways to be more performant or teaching us ways to think about things that we assumed work a certain way, like you know, web servers and provisioning and things like that. Uh, so we start noticing that we get back to this idea that maybe actually Rails can scale. It's possible. Except if you look at the browser timing, <laughs> uh, so that's the problem, except it's probably just more my problem than the problem of JavaScript. And thankfully also Nate can solve those problems for you and other people like him can help you figure out all of these things. But because we were building so fast and be, you know, growing, this is not something we had the time to focus on and eventually it starts to bite you and you spend way too much time looking at this graph. So performance is hard work, but really the thing that is even harder is people. Uh, and one thing that we learned to do at the time and since then, in the last two to three years, was to devalue the code. Stop thinking of it as a thing that we have to protect and care for and never discard or anything like that and overvalue the people because the people own the code, they own the product, they, they make you successful and also they make the customers learn, at least on our, on our side. So, when I look at just the last, what, five years, 
most of what I do is bulldoze code. That's just, I, I'm not a developer, I just delete lines of code, and that's basically what I've done because of this exact same problem. Because we have too much old code and it's really impossible to keep it up all together. And of course, whenever you reach a certain scale, security starts becoming an issue. Especially things like who has access to what. Especially when they get fired and you don't have access to the things that you used to have access because you didn't think through it. You didn't share the things because you're a scrappy startup and you're just sharing everything on a, I think it was a, uh, a little base camp, no, it was a 37 singles thing that you could write notes in. All of our passwords were in, in that one file. I remember seeing that one one day and going, oh my God, oh no. Um, and then people like this start showing up. They're fun. They send you little emails like this. This is the first email I managed to find from someone saying like, as I said, I have found several serious security vulnerabilities. So I want to ask you if you can make a team on HackerOne. HackerOne, hack, what, what is this? I look it up. Uh-oh, what is that? Uh, I, I didn't know what that was either, just like SOA, shame. I see a little activity thing, zoom in on it. Oh, so Twitter, Twitter just posted a vulnerability they had, and just there's someone's name, I don't really know who that is. $1,200 they were paid for this little vulnerability. I don't, I don't know much about the vulnerability, that seems like a good, decent amount of money, and also, why are they sharing that? I don't wanna share that, that's shameful. I mean, it turns out that HackerOne is part of a, a great little movement that started happening, kind of like what GitHub did to programming and sharing your code is this idea of just sharing the bug bounty to the rest of the world so that researchers have reputation, so they're not just this weird person who sends you weird emails with typos everywhere, because they do, and that you have some guidance for what to pay them based on the severity of the vulnerability that you're faced with. And also that you attract white hats before the black hats come over, which is not necessarily the case, but at least uh, some people tell you that you have holes in your software and you don't have to make these announcements to the rest of your customers whenever someone eventually finds out. So this is the time in which you, at which you realize that just putting you know, stuff over your ears and not looking at the vulnerabilities or not trying to think too hard about it because you're not a doctor or a hospital, so nobody's gonna die. Yeah, but people's, people's lives are connected to their credit cards and their email accounts and their accounts and all that stuff, especially when you start dealing with enterprise customers. And privacy, which has been in the news lately, becomes an issue too because you have customers in Germany, for instance, who have very specific needs when it comes to data retention. Things like leaderboards on CodeSchool or things we had to add toggles for features to disable because it's illegal to compete in a work setting, at least as far as we understood, in Germany. So we couldn't just show you how many points you had on a course unless we had some kind of provision for disabling that. The GDPR, if you haven't heard about it, you should really, really look it up now because you have a month and a half to deal with it, uh, is, is it actually going to change the way you develop? Not just as a, as, as a you know, alarmist statement. So PII is <laughs> personally identifiable information. So we, uh, we, I say we even though I'm French, but in the US people think of PII as your, you know, your address, your credit card, things that are sensitive. Uh, it turns out that with GDPR, the definition of personally identifiable information includes your computer's IP address. Now, if we think about the computer's IP address and Rails, if you look at how many people have downloaded Rails and how many people have downloaded the Vise, kind of get a sense for how many people are using the Vise in Rails, and that the Rails, the device module called Trackable, by default, tracks sign-in count, timestamps, and IP addresses, last IP address and current IP address. So probably, let's say, like, this many of you have IP addresses you're not supposed to have in your database if you're using Rails and device together. And you can look through your schema, you'll probably see it and realize, oh yeah, actually, yes, it is there, as it is for us. So are you GDPR compliant? When you start becoming more mature as a company, this is the kind of stuff that you worry about or you pay a lot of money for lawyers to worry about and uh, freak out. But when you're not, you don't know until you get fined. 
And I just noticed a few months ago, a few weeks ago, people started talking about it on, on, the, on Reddit for the, the Rails uh, subreddit. And there was a lot of answers, and most of the answers were like, oh, this is terrible, we paid a lot of money, and we don't know what to do, or we hope we'll finish in time. And if you check your email inbox, you will see that a lot of companies, especially the big ones right now, are sending waves and waves of emails saying like, oh my god, oh my god, yes, we have GDPR, you can take out your data, and we'll turn it off if you want, please, sorry. Um, if you look through Devices um, Issue Tracker, sadly, it doesn't seem like anybody's raised the issue. So, at that point, you've had a lot of data. For us, it's data like user accounts and subscriptions and also code submissions. Is that private? Is your Try Ruby submission from five years ago private data? Because you practice, then you type code that you technically own. Is that private data? I don't know. Probably not but also we're storing it, not because we need to, but because why not? We might find it useful to teach better later, but it's also data we store and is associated with you. That's a problem. Where does that data go when it's over? By over, I mean your company dies, or you get acquired, or I don't know, something else. And this is the present time we're getting to right now. So about four, three years ago, uh, as I said earlier, uh, Pluralsight acquired Code School, and since then we've worked with them to basically integrate a lot of the things that made us um, interactive and compelling into the platform over there, and during that three years, even though we took our time and we were really uh, responsible and careful to do it right, uh, eventually this had to happen. So on June 1st, 2018, in a month and a half, CodeSchool.com is going to shut down for good. That is sad. That makes me sad. Uh, I hate this word, sunset. Sunset is just the worst word to use for something like this because the sun comes back after a sunset. It's not dead. It's not like you're telling someone, oh, we're taking Rowdy to the farm. Horrible. We're not taking it to the farm. We're killing it or it's dying. So I even, I got so just used to this term that I even made the feature flipper for the sunset on codeskill.com sunset and I hate, I hate that I did that and I wanted to change it but it's too late. Uh, so after you announce a sunset or turn off your subscriptions and things like that, what happens is amazing. For the first time as a startup, you actually stop making money. So you're an actual startup for the first time in six years. It's not that fun actually. And uh, what happens is, I think that the problem with the words sunset and the words, you know, acqui acqui hire and things like that, is that people stop being honest about really what happened. It's like, this is something that we worked on for six years together. There's a lot of people who depend on it, and when we're saying we are shutting down code school forever, that's an honest statement. We're not doing it to be mean, we're doing it because it makes sense, we're doing it because We've moved on to something else, and we've adapted the things that we loved about it, but it still hurts for the people that use it, the people who built it for years, and uh, who for so many years defined themselves as the people who made that thing and were appreciated by the community and their, and their students for it. So while the, the spirit lives on, as, like I said, and a lot of the interactive fun stuff that we did at Code School are gonna live on in Plural Site, it still hurts. And it, it hurt for a long time, and then now it's different because now it's public and it doesn't hurt the same way, and now it's more acceptance. Uh, that said, we've never, I don't think anyone I know has ever thought, okay, what will I do if the thing, this thing I'm so excited about that I'm so devoted to dies or something happens or something that I don't expect happens. We don't really make a living will for the companies and projects and exciting things that we work on. Code school is 20%, over 20% of my adult life. Actually, my whole life. Uh, so it's not like this little thing that just disappears. Um, and it took me a long time to just think, okay, well, there's an after, and there's great people. And that's the thing that I think I wanna focus on at the end of this, is I don't want to be defined by the thing that I made that is a legacy app. I don't want to have that only be my legacy. I want it to be the people that I worked with, 
the people that I influenced or touched or the students in Malaysia in the middle of the night while we were doing a free weekend on, on a Saturday and I was the night shift because I am terrible at sleeping, who sent tweets with you know the weather outside in Malaysia to say, hey, we're doing this code school free weekend with you. And it's just like, wow, I'll never meet that many people in my entire life. And they're using this thing that I we're making all together and learn and finding work from it, finding meaning from it. So I, I try to think back on the things that could have made this adventure better or just generally the things that we should do because it's about the people is if there's toxic people, get them out of there. Don't wait because it's proper. Don't wait because it's professional because raising your voice is something that you're not you know, defining yourself as someone who's angry. Get angry at people who are toxic. Get angry at people who mess with your team and the people that matter. Nurture the good people, the people that join your team and the junior developers that so many people think that they can't, you know, they, they don't need to build a company. These are the people who stick around. These are the people who just have loyalty and will become the thing that you're building more than the people who just come in and swoop in. And share ownership with them. Make them trust them. Give them the keys and just if they screw up, help them out. Don't blame them for screwing up. And the product, and I don't mean the product as a, as a thing that you sell, I mean the product, the result of the things that you did with the people. Uh, get involved in the community that is part or that is around that product. Get involved with the people that you work with or the support team that supports your software. Get involved with them and see what they're actually doing in the front lines when they're talking to people who use your product. Uh, accept mortality, accept that there are good constraints around the things that you do. You don't have enough time, you don't have enough money, you uh, don't know how to build the thing. These are good things, these are not, that. we keep trying to fight the idea that we're gonna run out of money. These are good constraints, these are things that make you choose things more responsibly, uh, avoid wasting your time doing things that you might not need to do, so accept it. And then finally, the ideas. Share them, share the good things that are part of your team culture. Sometimes we get protective because we're afraid that if we share those things, maybe we'll ruin it or maybe people will make fun of us because it's naive. There's so many things that we did at Code School or that we still do at Code School that are naive. We have a compliments app that just, we send a little thing and a little dashboard would show in the kitchen like a nice thing someone said about someone just because we wanted to foster that. And it's just something that I think Katie Delphin did one day because she felt like she, she wanted to share the little note, note cards and she realized that she wanted to ha help other people do the same thing, make it easier. I think, um, I think Terrence Lee and uh, Richard Schneeman started doing that a few years ago at, at, at RailsConf, just giving people little cards to say thank you. I appreciated what you did or I appreciate you just as you, not for what you do necessarily. Focus on joy, focus on those little, little moments. I know that early on in the, in the story of Go2, a lot of it was fear, a lot of it was stressful. But there's little moments of joy, like when we finally released a course on for July 4th and there was a huge success and we had tons of other things to do but we could focus on that joy for a little bit. And learn by doing, of course, because that's our motto. Um, I think that's a, that's a thing that I mean, I learned from Code School, ended up working at Code School, so this is something that's very clear uh, to me as, a, as an advantage. And as David just said this morning, those two things are connected, just-in-time learning, just even if this is Stack Overflow, uh, it's, it's okay not to know everything, it's okay to discover it as you go, and if we can help others discover things as we go or help them get in the community that we've made, it would be amazing. Thank you very much.